Well, good morning all, and thank you very much for joining me for this first, first plenary. Um, I'm Elizabeth Davis, a member of the Civil Jan Justice Council, alongside uh, being chair of the Office for Legal Complaints and deputy chair of support through court. For everyone in this conference, COVID-19 and its implications continues to dominate much of our personal and professional lives. So this is a theme that rightly permeates much of the conference agenda today. And I make no apologies if we therefore stray into the territory of the other plenaries, either what's been said or what's coming up. Um, so this session is an opportunity to acknowledge head on what the consequences of the pandemic have been for those without means. As importantly, it is a chance to consider what has been done in response and to openly and honestly recognise what has and has not worked. And indeed, whether there is sufficient evidence to even answer this question with confidence at this stage. So I think we'll be drilling down in a little bit more detail in some of the issues that have come up in the across the room plenary uh, that you heard um, that Sir Robin uh, facilitated earlier. So in the session, I'm keen that we do justice really to all three aspects of the title. So we want to pick up on consequences, response and effectiveness. Now, I also want to hear from you. I do want to try and respond to the questions and the points that you are making. So please use the Q&A box on the right hand side of your screen and please feel comfortable doing that from now onwards. And again, if you have any technical queries you heard earlier, but you've got the live support button on the top menu bar. Now, just to get us started, because we have a very able panel of five, and I can assure you that you will be hearing from all of them, but just to get us started, I wanted you to hear two different perspectives at the outset. So we're going to be hearing from Chris Minnock, the Chief Executive Officer of the Legal Aid Practitioners Group. But before we do that, let's start by hearing from Chilly Reid, who is Executive Director of Advice UK. Over to Chilly. So thank everybody. Yeah, uh, very welcome. Uh, great to see everybody, sort of. Um, I work for Advice UK. I, I'll briefly explain what that means. It's Advice UK is a big chunk uh, of the advice sector, about 650 members, ranging from national debt line, you heard from Meg von Ruin earlier, to uh, Trust Trust Food Banks, uh, anything in between. There are 40 uh, employer um, employer organisations, about 90 specialists, so a complete range. We have a sense, a more general sense of what's happened as a result of the pandemic. I'd like to start to say one thing before I do start, which is that I'd like to pay my respects to members of the advice sector that have actually, unfortunately, we've lost, who have passed away as a result of the pandemic. I think we should um, bring the personal bit into that as well. So my respects are paid to them and other colleagues. Yes, yeah, so enormous, I and mean, what a year, 2020. So the pandemic, I mean, we have these high level, level figures around increase in poverty. We have figures that tell that 6 million more people are uh, unable to pay their bills when they fall due, enormous impact. And that those those types of impacts always will come to the to the advice sector. And indeed they they are. Um, and the advice sector, Advice UK members included, have reacted in certain ways, incredibly positive response. I mean, in March and April, the first shock, if you like, was the that the services that have largely been face to face were forced uh, by nature of the pandemic and social distancing and the lockdown to, to move to home. And that was a big issue for some of the small organisations, but by and large, they succeeded. So the workers, the advice workers, the organisational response was amazing. Uh, swift uh, and effective, but it wasn't, of course, that simple for the clients of advice services. And Fran Target referred to this before. There's still an issue that there are so-called disappeared uh, clients who are just unable to access organisations because of um, digital exclusion, digital poverty. The reality for many people, many clients, is that yes, they may have a smartphone, but actually they were previously using a cafe to access unsecured Wi-Fi or a library, and when they closed, they lost they lost access. And other people who are just don't have the access are an issue and something we need to talk about and deal with going forwards. The unholy trinity, if you can use that expression, of welfare benefits, debt and housing that are so interlinked, they've, they've been affected massively. But the irony, slightly, in demand terms for advice services is that some of those people who were being chased for debts before, 
some might have had mortgage arrears have been put on hold. So for me, the question about the effects of the pandemic are, yes, immediate effects, but actually six, nine, 12 months in the future, what happens then? And we'll come back to, I'll come back to that a bit later. So the advice that to work from home, move to work from home pretty effectively. I mean, we really what really happened and coalesced amazingly, I think, in in March and April and May was the that the advice sector and support of the advice sector came together. So there's some amazing responses, uh, responses from members and, and actually Zoom has actually helped us work together far more effective than previously. So one positive is that Zoom uh, has worked for providers and support of providers. And some of the funders' responses were just extraordinary. I'd like to mention the Legal Education Foundation at this point, a great response, immediate response, no strings response. Uh, and similar to the Development of Justice Fund, Claire Carter speaks later, and some of the law funds were extraordinary. I mean, I'd mentioned before, I think Rebecca Greenhouse, who was on the call, amazing responses and fantastic responses, and they need to go. And we also worked amazingly well during the summer. So since Advice, Law Centres Network, LAPG, you'll hear from Chris in a few minutes, Advice UK, we've coalesced and worked more effective than ever before, particularly on issues around the housing, the state of evictions, which had some frustrations. We need to work, we'll keep working together in the future. We've worked, thought to work well with the judiciary and we need to work, I think, uh, more effective with government if we can. There's been some frustrations there with, with MOJ, LAA uh, and MHCLG, but we'll, we'll work to work on that. The immediate future, I mean, what we're going to really think about is what's going to happen with those disappeared clients. What's also going to happen, actually, when we come to March uh, and, you know, the credit, two million more people claim that, that £20 extra stops. It's not very much money, but it will stop. Also, we've got the issue of the stay on evictions will stop. The mortgage, re mortgage holidays will stop. Uh, and, of course, the long term impacts, economic impacts, the pandemic will hit. Our job is to prepare our members and others for that. And alas, one thing I have to say, one effect, one less positive effect is that people are in our member centres, especially the specialist member centres, are pretty exhausted. So workforce development, workforce support, workforce well-being is something I think we should think about in this conference generally. Um, the immediate future, of course, is not uh, also simple because we have just not just the uh, the pandemic, but of course, Brexit, uh, whether we like it or not, uh, in 20 days time will, will impact. And I think the, the call for me is not a call for to arms, but a call to brains uh, and all people who are here today uh, and beyond to work together and to recognise that the advice sector, the so-called generous advice sector, is a key entry point for people who are seeking access to justice. And if we really mean what we say, then we need to get together in the coming year, coming years more than ever before, exceptional times, we need exceptional responses. And so far, I would say the advice, advice sector has done brilliantly. Uh, as have others, but we really have, have a lot more to do. And I'm positive about that in what is an extraordinary year. Good morning, everybody. And thank you, Elizabeth, for the introduction uh, and to the Civil Justice Council for the invitation to speak today. I've been asked to speak from a provider perspective uh, and as the CEO of LAPG, I'll speak from a legal aid practitioner perspective. We represent and provide support services to solicitors, barristers, legal executives, caseworkers, cost specialists, and the crucial indispensable support staff that deliver legal aid services. So I'll try and touch on, if I may, um, the perspective of uh, the pandemic from, from that perspective. So as Chile's said, and a number of other speakers have already said today, um, there was an instant uh, significant damaging effect to both clients and providers um, from lockdown and beyond. The courts ground to a halt and pr practitioners could no longer interact with their clients in person, in their offices, in outreach locations, the legal aid providers, they couldn't go into prisons and hospitals and immigration detention centers. Um, there was a significant impact on the availability of new work and on the ability to progress existing cases, which has a serious impact, therefore, on the ability to conclude cases um, and uh, in, in examples such as inquests and tribunal proceedings, legal aid, payment arrangements uh, rely on proceedings, uh, in many cases, reaching a conclusion to get paid. There are serious concerns for, and as Chile's just spoken about, um, well, a complete lack of a complete absence of data about those clients who could not contact advice services uh, and legal aid lawyers. And this is despite a recognized increase in demand for advice 
on debt, housing, benefits, employment, domestic abuse, a whole range of areas. Many areas of legal aid resumed, albeit slowly, as the courts and tribunals tooled up from new remote working arrangements. Some practitioners uh, were inundated with, for example, care proceedings, while others uh, demand fell off a cliff face. Providers rapidly adjusted to remote working and took advantage of government relief measures, but those measures did not ameliorate the financial impact of lockdown. Legal aid contracts are orientated around predominantly face-to-face -face services. Clients need to provide documentary evidence of means, physically signed, form, signed forms, etc. So there's a, a need to consider what had to be done to reorientate services in what is a regulatory and compliance morass. Uh, and what are the effects of the individuals delivering services? Chile's just talked about the need for thinking about the workforce. We surveyed practitioners in the summer, over 400 responded, and the results were and remain alarming. The majority of practitioners were stressed, overworked, burnt out, anxious, struggling to sleep, struggling to balance work and home life whilst working from home. Very few were able to access any form of support service to help them with the psychological impact of the pandemic. So what's been done in response? A great deal of energy was expended in March and April by representative membership bodies uh, to explain and try and deal with the practical impact of lockdown. There's been a tremendous amount of cooperation as Chile has just explained and as others will in a moment, across the sector, between legal aid organizations, between representative bodies and across the, the broader sector. This has continued throughout the pandemic and it's an extension of the strong links between organizations that existed before the crisis. HMCTS, the Legal Aid Agency, the Ministry of Justice, they all mobilised probably as quickly as we can expect large organisations to mobilise to deal with the most pressing issues. Remote hearings, the tech required to support that work, the necessary stay on possession proceedings, the abilities to submit urgent applications electronically, and for legal aid practitioners, the relaxation of some of the compliance aspects of legal aid contracts, which are predicated on face-to-face office-based services. Pausing auditing um, arrangements, those sorts of things. Systems and protocols were implemented quickly, even at the time we were frustrated by the pace of change. Gradually, and after much pressure from the rep bodies, the Legal Aid Agency and the Ministry of Justice also started to explore the necessity for new payment mechanisms for legal aid, new payment on account arrangements, and other measures to improve cash flow. They're exploring interim payments for case types that currently only enable payment at the conclusion of the case, but Fundamentally, these initiatives do not make legal aid work more viable, as they're simply payments for the work that's already been done, work done with great skill and commitment and expertise, but at commercially unsustainable fees that haven't increased for over 20 years, and in real terms have actually been cut across the board in that time. So enabling providers to more quickly claim fees that don't even cover the cost of delivering services doesn't remedy the underlying failure to properly remunerate the expert lawyers carrying out the service certainly doesn't make the organisations delivering legal aid more robust and more able to withstand the impact of the pandemic. What has worked? There have been some examples, many useful practical examples, actually, of how interaction between practitioners and officials has mitigated some of the effects of lockdown on both clients and those striving to deliver services. And others will, quite rightly, Chile just has, uh, mentioned the fantastic effort of the funders and foundations to support the not-for-profit sector. Uh, and I've mentioned some other examples of positive practice already. But the event today must acknowledge that so much more could and should have been done. If you talk to legal aid practitioners, and I do all the time, the general feeling is that they've been let down, ignored and taken for granted. They've risked their lives in health and police stations, magistrates courts. They've responded at all hours of the night to desperate calls from victims of domestic abuse. They've had to mount legal challenges just to get public services to fill, fulfill their obligations with no guarantee that they're going to get paid for their work. They've done countless hours of policy work unpaid to try and keep systems going and help officials to shape policy responses to the pandemic. This is not new, this is what legal aid practitioners have always done, but it's been doubly difficult during the pandemic. And throughout, the government has failed to provide specific targeted financial support to ensure that legal aid providers will still be here in the near future when they will be needed most. There's been a failure to recognise the need to, for support, but I must add that I don't believe that failure has been within the Ministry of Justice. I believe that's been in other parts of government. But it's a failure nonetheless to support a sector that's seen a dr dramatic reductions in their numbers over the last 10 years under this austerity programme. 
there's been a 40% reduction in civil legal aid providers over the last 10 years, which I can go into more detail later if necessary. The government has praised court staff, probation, prison officers, the CPS, and rightly so in most cases, but all too often and with depressing predictability, legal aid lawyers have been overlooked and undervalued, and more recently, vilified, and this has to change. Uh, we're here to talk about the future, uh, but without greater support and recognition for the work of legal aid lawyers, there will be no access to justice in the future for those without means. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed to Chris and Chile there. And let me introduce you all to your uh, wider panel. So I'll do introductions as we come to colleagues. Um, can I perhaps start by going to uh, Sham Pop, who's Director of Caseworker Advocate. Um, Sham, I'd really be interested in hearing more from you on the effectiveness of remote hearings. One of the messages that we heard earlier was that the same issues are facing litigants in person they're still there. So if you like, the problems of remote justice are, are just more acute for litigants in person than they were previously. Um, what, what's your experience of the effectiveness of remote hearings? And from our perspective, remote hearings have worked and very well in the sense that we have, as a result, managed to place more cases than we've ever been able to do this year. And um, we placed over 60 percent last year and that's primarily because um we can have barristers operating in it and then and then yeah cool and from that perspective it's really positive for us and, and we'd like to see that continue where possible um but equally day in and day out our applicants are calling various problems that they're facing and um, with technology that um you know one one client of ours called up and said they didn't actually know who their barrister was and they were on, on the telephone call hearing and the other, they thought the other side barrister was actually their own barrister and that poses obviously very um, significant difficulties um applicants with disabilities as well um, um the technology wasn't working in their case and then um they actually couldn't log on via video and because they had a disability and um they couldn't actually use their speech to text facility so then couldn't participate in the hearing at all um, and as a result the hearing had to be adjourned um, and an already adjourned hearing as a result of an adjourned until next year. And so these litigants are waiting even longer for their for their chance to to appear in court, which is incredibly difficult for them. And when they're already anxious, um, that makes them even more um, unable to, to get the voice heard. Sure, thank you for court. that. Um, Victoria, perhaps we could hear from you next. So this is Victoria Speed, you're the COVID-19 response coordinator for the Employment Legal Advice Network. Um, Victoria, again, one of the things we've already heard about is this sense of a backlog plus new issues created by the specifics of the pandemic. It would be easy to assume that one of those new set of issues is precisely around employment issues. Tell us your experience. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, nice to sort of see you and thanks so much for the opportunity to speak today. So yeah, I am, um, Elan has been for a while, uh, a number of years now, and I started with the network right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, my experience from then until now has been um, quite unbelievable. Um, what, what I saw were people working immensely hard to cope with an overnight change in their working conditions um, and an unbelievable increase in demand which of those two things, those two things by themselves are quite significant, but actually what then happened, and employment lawyers here will remember, it was that almost week by week, the guidance changed. Um, and usually that was Friday night at sort of 8 p.m. Something was coming out. And I think we, we, we talked a little bit about the uh, well-being of people working in this sector, and I'm specifically here to talk about employment um, practitioners. And in the network that we have, they're not all lawyers, there's a range of expertise, there's a lot of people uh, who have experience who are coping as best they can, but actually just trying to keep up with the change in law was such a challenge. Um, and I think I think it's really hard for some people to imagine what it's like to have to be doing that on your own in addition to your work. So your work has already increased and then suddenly you've got a new word called furlough, which nobody had ever really used in employment context before. And unlike many firms where there's lots of know-how lawyers and teams making sure that everybody's up to date, you know, you might be sitting on your own in your lounge trying to give 
10 people advice that day without really being sure that what you're saying is right. Um, at the same time, there's lots of people working around you going back on, on what's been given because there's challenges around whether it applies correctly to lots of people. So uh, for me, from my perspective, I have a background working in a, in a big law firm and I know what it was like to feel safe with what you're providing being the right thing. And I think that, that, that the need to do that and the need to bring everybody together in a way to make sure they constantly have confidence in their own knowledge at this time has been really important. Um, and I think the, the isolation of the, the advisors feel is something I've seen. So the advice that what they, you know, employment law has not, in, in, in of itself, the law, the sort of usual law around unfair dismissal hasn't changed, but obviously what's come out is all these new things, um, which everyone was creating as we went along. So it was, it, initially we were having meetings every week just so that people could talk about what questions they had, um, how they were experiencing that with their clients, the impact of those new regulations on various groups, particularly um, pregnant women or agency workers or zero hours workers, and how um, how that advice could go out and how best to support the extremely vulnerable workers in this situation. So yeah, it's been, um, I mean, that has, it's been quite a dynamic change, um, but I, I really feel it's important to to note and to plan going forward on how to collectively pool knowledge and share experience so that so that no no advisor should feel isolated or concerned that what they're doing is is um is you know they need to feel confident in what they're doing and at the pace that that was going on that was very difficult victoria thank you for that um could i just remind colleagues listening as well do please use the live q a um, function if you have any questions that you would like me to put to the panel. I can't see anything coming through at the moment, um, so if you'd like me to put anything, um, please do so. Um, I'd like to bring in here um, Claire Carter. Um, Claire, you're Deputy Chief Executive at the Access to Justice Foundation. Um, you had both Chile and Chris actually referring to the amazing responses of the funders, um, fantastic kind of effort on the part of the funders. Those were just kind of two of the quotes that were referenced. Um, how have the funders been responding? It's very kind of, of Chile and Chris, but, but we have the easy job and I, and I think um, really recognise that. Um, having said that, it, it was really positive to see kind of from a funder perspective, many trusts and foundations immediately relaxed um, a lot of their requirements around use of funds, reporting and deadlines. Um, a number of collaborative funds emerged, um, including the Community Justice Fund, which, um, which has been mentioned and I wanted to talk a, a little bit about. Um, so at the Access to Justice Foundation back in March when we were hearing from our grantees about um, all the difficulties that, that other panel members have outlined, we were obviously really concerned and one of the things we were concerned about is that grantees were going to need to be making emergency applications to eight or nine different funders for the same thing um, and it felt like that was something that we could do something about by, by getting together. Um, so we did, and a group of funders um, got together um, and set up the um, Community Justice Fund, which enabled um, specialist advice organisations to apply through a single application portal and to have their application considered by a range, thereby um, improving their chances um, and simplifying the process. Uh, we were able to distribute over £11.5 million over the summer. The fund was open from May to September, or wave one was open from May to September, um, and many thanks to the significant contributions that we received from the Ministry of Justice and the National Lottery Community Fund, but also a range of trusts and foundations, uh, plus law firms, the Law Society, Chambers, and, and individual lawyers through our emergency appeal. So um, I think one of the great things about the fund is that we had contributions from five pounds to five million pounds. Um, so we'll, we'll take money from anybody, that's a shameless plug for wave two. Um, so, so that was all good that we were able to do that, um, but totally echoing what's been said, there's so much more to do. We, we're hearing really strongly from the front line um, that the crisis is ongoing, um, not just in terms of the financial gap, but the impending increase in demand is enormous with the number of people being made redundant and applying for benefits. Some of our grantees are projecting 50% increase in demand. Um, and the grants that we were able to make this summer all come to an end by April 2021. So there's a real financial cliff edge. Um, we've been working not only as a group of funders, but together with the umbrella bodies and, and frontline agencies to develop a longer term strategy to support the sector. Um, this feels more important than ever. 
and that strategy will focus on sustaining advice services, getting the law to the people who need them most, in, including the disappeared clients that, that Chile was talking about, and minoritized communities who were already facing um, barriers to accessing services, um, to increase our reach through the, through the use of innovation, um, and also to make the case to new audiences for the importance of the use of the law as a tool for social justice. We feel really strongly as a group of funders that we need to do more to champion the sector and to grow the, the, the funding pie, as it were. Um, so as I mentioned, we are currently fundraising for Wave 2 grants. We are planning to open um, a, a new funding round, Wave 2, in February. Um, and I'm really keen to hear from any funders who'd like to get involved. So please do get in touch. Thank you. Claire, thank you very much from, for that. Um, we've got a question that's coming from the floor. Um, <coughs> I asked the question about, um, <coughs> excuse me, all remote justice earlier. And I suppose the risk is that the assumption is that that's about access to online courts. Uh, the question from the floor is, and I think we'll possibly start with you, Victoria, with regard to this and then maybe broaden it out. Do you think there is scope for increasing online mediation, um, whether in employment, landlord and tenant, family matters, and how can this be achieved? A uh, particularly timely one for you to reflect on, Victoria, I know. I've literally just come from an assessment to become a mediator <laughs> and I did it all online so I can tell you I hope it worked. <laughs> um, I actually, as part of my role, I've been working quite closely with Camilla Palmer who I, I don't suppose is the person who asked that question but if she's <laughs> indeed actually. <laughs> uh, she did. Okay well there we go. Hi Camilla. Um, so the, the since we started, uh, since I started in this role, I've been working very closely with Camilla in her role at Yes Law to set up and roll out a pro bono mediation project specifically for employment law. It's called Draw um, and it's available, it's funded by Trust for London and therefore available at this moment to London workers and London um, London employers, basically. And there there has been uh, there's great success and potential of running this online um it has uh, it's, it's so much easier to kind of meet with people subject to all of the issues around access and internet and everything that we we, we know are there so i'm just going to deal with when it does work when it does work you you're not it's perhaps less intimidating um you can stop the session and come back to the session a lot more easily there's a lot less cost involved because you don't have to hire a room or have the location or have everyone come in there's no travel cost involved so there's lots of pluses around it what we have um, found is that when it does work it's working brilliantly but actually what we definitely experienced is that the sort of education of getting people to the point where they think about it is much more difficult and we believe that there's a lot of scope to work with employer organizations um, to influence and change the way that you deal with uh, mediation and the and, and to use very successful mediation from other areas to build it into employment work. But I, I think since you asked the question, I'd also ask for anyone else to contribute to that discussion. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Thank you for that. Can, can I open that up more, more broadly? So kind of any thoughts on either mediation or indeed any other forms of ADR? Can I come in there? Yeah. I, I, I can definitely oh, sorry, see. Chris. Am I muted? Uh, no, we can hear you. Sorry, Chris. And Chili will come in after you. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you. So I can definitely see some advantages through technology uh, in using ADR in terms of a, a tool for connecting people. I think I just have to, and I'm very interested to hear and to, and to look at the experiences from I think we heard earlier in the, in the event from the um, mediation services being piloted in Northern Ireland for private rented sector land and tenant disputes. But I think there's, there's a real problem, and I, and I think this is being thought through very carefully for England and Wales, there's a real problem with an imbalance of power in most of these disputes. Um, and mediation or ADR might not be the best mechanism uh, to try and resolve what are essentially complex legal problems. There are very few of these issues that, uh, that get to the point of dispute that don't have a complex uh, legal foundation behind them, and in particular, uh, a complex set of rights and protections for tenants. So housing, for example, might not be a good example where mediation would be, uh, would be advisable because of the complexity of the law because of the remedies that are available and because of the imbalance of power generally between the landlord and tenant, both in terms of knowledge, but definitely in terms of resources. Thank you for that, Chris. Chile, you wanted to come in. Actually, I was going to say exactly the same thing that Chris has said, uh, which may be no surprise to some people who know about our work, because of course, 
Uh, we've been heavily, heavily involved in the uh, housing possession court duty schemes, uh, the MI working group, and of course, at the moment, there's a tender uh, out for a mediation um, service, if that's the right word, uh, around the, around, with the courts, basically, around house, land housing, so landlord and tenants, and we have, at Vashi K, uh, we have some reservations, similar to what Chris said, really, about balance of, of not power, uh, but knowledge and, and you know, complex legal issues. I take what was said about the north of Ireland, mm. um, but we, yeah, we, mediation works fantastic in some areas, but we're not sure that it, it, the government is very keen on mediation, and we have confidence that it can be hosted, but, but, but brought into all areas of, of, of the law, particularly where we're supporting people uh, who are, you know, substantially weaker than the parties that may be a case against them. Sham and Victoria want to come in. My, my question would be, is it the role of the mediator to help um, address that imbalance of power? So let's, let's hear from Sham first. Yeah, thank you. All I was, was going to add to, to that, and I echo what Victoria said earlier, because so, we are advocate and uh, facilitate uh, mediations with Elan and encourage our clients to go through there and also with the Chance Street Bar Association. Um, but where, where we find mediations works is where the litigant in person, because that's um, ultimately who we're, we're supporting, gets legal advice. Um, and if they can get legal advice prior to their mediation and during their mediation, then you'll get an effective mediation because A, they need to be educated about what mediation is, but also what the possibilities of any outcomes are. So I think they have to work hand in hand. And I think a mediation without any advice Free advice Victoria, final thoughts on this. It makes it much harder for Yeah, I just add that we found it to work effectively where there is um, pro bono support for the uh, employee actually at the mediation. And I, I was wondering whether Sean would raise the fact that there's been some, um, uh, that have, have been a few cases where the barristers, ad, uh, pro bono barristers from advocate have acted on behalf of the litigating person at that mediation, which has helped address that balance of power. But also the reality for employment is that you're waiting otherwise a very, very long time to go to a tribunal. And there's a lot of a, a lot of facts to take into account before you make that decision rather than solve it on the day at a mediation. Thank you for that. We have another question from the floor all, and um, this is kind of moving us into the territory. And I suppose picking up on your point, Chile, about there's there's the responses um, in the past and currently, and there's also then this kind of issue of the longer term effect and the longer term responses. This is a question from uh, Ian Besford. Whilst remote hearing has caused some difficulty to litigants, on balance, does the panel think that the ability to have remote access to the courts without the necessity to attend courts which may be some distance from the party, is a benefit which should remain an option. Let's go to Chile first with regard to that. Um, I think that, and speaking to colleagues about this, so much closer to it in terms of tribunals and court work, is that I call it, it's a double-edged sword. So if people if people can, access to justice means access to justice. So if a, if a online hearing or remote hearing um, in some form or other denies that or perhaps the barrier then that's got to be questioned if we can be certain that you know everything there's legal support the support for yeah, legal support basically we're we're happy if we can be certain that when people access remote hearings they have they have every aspect of what they need to have covered as they might uh, in a face-to-face -face hearing i mean so the concerns usually come from uh, people not being able to uh, full, be fully supported legally uh, and or just not have, be able to fully utilise the technology. And of course, there are hybrid hearings and other ways there's, there's promises or security information CTS that there'll always be a paper paper tray or paper hearing or face-to-face or -face hearing. So, yeah, we'll see. But, yeah, we're not, there's no, I don't think anybody would say intrinsically it's a bad idea. I think we just all need to be certain that the, the again, the weaker party, if you want to use that expression, uh, as the security of, of, of support uh, and, and legal support. And can I stick with you, Chile, before we perhaps kind of hear Chris's views on this? Uh, there's a point coming through from Lizzie Iron from Support Through Court, which is all about, I think, kind of not falling into that trap of assuming those without means are a single homogenous group. Different people require different things. Something that comes up every CJC conference is that kind of issue of triage. Where does that assessment take place? Uh, who does that? Kind of any views on that? I, I think this is cool. I think, and again, there's no 
sort of right or wrong about this. And I think there's a perception that parts of the advice sector want everything to be stuck in 1972 and everything's face to face and there's no no movement and don't embrace technology, which is factually uh, incorrect. Maybe there's a few a few <laughs> dinosaurs knocking around, but um, I, I agree with Lizzie that it's, it's, it's on a case, not case by case basis, but we believe there's enormous potential uh, advantage to certain sections of the population from having on so-called online justice or attempts at online justice. Um, and we just got to be, again, I'm repeating myself slightly, but just be extremely careful and sort of cognizant and have the broader context of, of people and how they best access justice and how justice is best served, if you like. Thank you for that, Chili. Chris, I saw you nodding there. What are your views? I agree, I agree with Chili. There isn't a, a one size fits all uh, response. Uh, and I think the original question was, should it remain on the table as an option? Of course, the, the answer to that is yes. Um, but that has a, a lot of caveats attached to it. So research, and this is a gross generalization, but research suggests that remote hearings work very well for interlocutory proceedings and proceedings that involve professionals. Professionals like to interact this way. Does it work well for litigants and parties? Um, that is a very open and yet to be resolved question and I suspect it will be resolved positively for some and very, very negatively for others. Some of our members have reported some quite horrendous experiences of trying to support clients to remote hearings particularly hearings um, which, when you think about the scope of legal aid now, which is, is largely complex cases that involve traumatised clients and very complex um, emotional issues as well as legal issues. It's very hard to see how uh, clients in those circumstances, however capable they are outside of their legal problem, can interact properly in a virtual way. So Chili's mentioned hybrid hearings. Um, we've had practitioners who ensure that while they're dealing remotely with the hearing, they've got a separate system set up to deal directly and privately with their client. Um, with all sorts of issues about remote um, justice, when you think about um, people in detention, people with mental health problems, people in hospitals who, you know, who are being detained, um, young people in uh, youth offending. There's, there's so many complications um, um, that I would have to urge extreme caution before we decide that we can continue with what's had to occur. Things have had to occur over the last six or seven months. Um, and I know there are a lot of good people looking at uh, whether or not they should continue, which is probably what um, prompted that question. Yeah, uh, thank you for that, Chris. Can I just bring in a comment from the floor here from Adam uh, Micklethwaite, who's kind of pointing out the kind of challenges to internet access, obviously for a, for a significant number of the population. And I think that highlights kind of issues around vulnerability. Um, Adam's question is really kind of the panel's views on what can be done to address these very specific um, issues around vulnerability. Um, Sham and Victoria, I mean, is, is this something that, that, that you've been specifically looking at? Uh, let's start with Sham. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a really um, interesting topic because I think um, I think IT and technology is compounded by the, the regional and national lockdowns that have happened as a result of COVID and um, with um, citizen advice bureaus shutting their face-to-face -face service, with libraries being shut, a lot of our applicants cannot access um, computers. And so um, I advocate, um, as Chile referenced, we did move from 1972 to an, an online application form, um, which was a revolution for us. But it did mean that a lot of our applicants and, and therefore access our services um, and really struggled. Um, and so looking to the future, we do need to work with those those individuals to make sure that they aren't denied the ability to get pro bono help or even legal aid help um, just because they don't have the technology. Um, but even when you have technology, and I think um, it's been referenced earlier, um, it's incredibly difficult to, it's so easy now to just forward your, your life to um, your legal advisor. Um, we had one applicant um, in the last couple of weeks who had a, a money case against a former partner um, and he sent us over 2,000 pages of, of documents. Um, many of the documents are pictures of his feet, what he had for dinner that day, ice cream. Um, his case was about money and nothing to do with any of the stuff that we sent. So um, our really small um, advocate team spent a lot of time um, hand-holding through the process and trying to understand what his actual legal issue was. Um, and if he lost, would um, potentially make him liable for £100,000 worth of costs. So I think that quite dramatically um, 
the real need out there if um, when you're using technology you have to support people through that technology otherwise they'll just feel even more abandoned. Thank you for that Sham. Sham we lost you for a little bit during that but I don't think any of us lost the essence of, of what you were saying there but just to acknowledge that. Um, Vic Victoria, vulnerability, how's that fit into mm -hmm. your work? So there's a lot of organisations looking into sort of digital access and I think that, that is it's been highlighted in our group largely because they say that the sort of nature of the client that they have over the they've had over the last nine months is quite different from before. Um because employment losing your your income can affect you no matter what salary you're on. Like if suddenly overnight you don't earn any money, that can lead to all sorts of consequences. But they are all noted that there are the disappeared. I think that's one area of ability. But the other is really this whole idea of vulnerable workers. And there's a real um, request within Elam that people stop talking about being employed and employment at work because for some people they are they are earning what they need to to, to get by and they and they don't they're not they're not by any stretch treated as employees with any and they don't feel they've got rights. So so for those there's lots of vulnerability um, in in the workplace and that might be language barriers. Lots of our members experience uh, individuals with severe mental health issues. Um, we had a session very recently on um, the modern um, how to spot modern slavery as an employment advisor uh, there's 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 a lot of work trying to but but there's so much to overcome that's a lot to put on small organizations relying on small funds to to change all of that but i think it's important to pull all of those things and not just look at one area because digital digital access is is a huge issue um but there's lots of other issues every day in London that are affecting our network. Thank you for that all. Well, I want to kind of move on to kind of hearing some closing remarks from each of you. Um, not surprisingly, that issue of digital access is kind of raising further issues from the floor. If I just kind of recognise that Diane Astin is making um, a very interesting point about standards directions on a case and obviously kind of uh, uh, litigants being told that participating on a mobile phone is not acceptable and recommended the use of two screens recognising that that's simply not realistic for so many litigants in person. Um, and there's also been follow up to that kind of issue of mediation from Ellen Lefley, um, who has kind of asked a question around whether the panellists have experience of knowledge of legally assisted mediation or early neutral evaluation models which can work for litigants in person. So again, I think it's opening that up beyond mediation, looking at other and wider forms of ADR. We won't have the chance to address those, but I did want to kind of acknowledge that those points are kind of there and being made. Um, I'd be interested now to move and hearing from the panel just your final reflections. And I, so I want us to kind of really focus on the future, really. Um, you've each touched on this in different ways, but my question to each of you is, what's the key learning? Where is there scope for doing things better in the future? And as I say, just brief thoughts from each of you. Um, Claire, let's start from you. What, what are funders going to be doing differently in the future? You've obviously been getting a huge amount right during the pandemic in store over the next year. I think the, the key thing for me for next year and, and for the Community Justice Fund is the importance of, importance of new conversations and new collaborations. I think we've proved this year we're very good at talking to each other um, and we've achieved a lot there. But actually, we need to get better at talking to the people who need the advice the most, the excluded communities who were excluded prior to the pandemic, and even more so now. But also other sectors, um, learning from other sectors and championing the work that happens in the advice sector um, to other funders particularly, but to broader civil society. And, uh, and this concept of using the law as a tool for social justice, it's not just something for lawyers. This is relevant to the, the whole of society and we need to maybe break out a little bit from our echo chamber and talk to others about why that's important and why it's relevant to them. So that's that's the plan for next year. Thank you very much for that, Claire. Sham, what about for you? Um, I think from our perspective, I think um, we were able, 100% able to go online. And I think I'm um, agreeing with others that earlier, I think other, you know, organisations should definitely go online if they can. Um, I think we need to acknowledge that the profession, and especially from the pro bono side of it, has stood up remarkably well. And we're incredibly grateful for the barristers and our, on our volunteer panel that have done so much pro bono um, through lockdown. Um, but we also need to acknowledge that you know, a lot of members of the bar have been hit financially as a result of the pandemic. So we need to look at ways of working with them um, so that pro bono isn't forgotten about. 
Um, I think we need to embrace technology. I think it, it has worked, but as I spoke about earlier, we need to um, we need to assist people through technology so that they're not then um, they're not denied justice because they can't use their mobile phone. And I think that's incredibly important. Um, and I think we also need to go um, into the community more. We need to work with local community organisations to make sure that the most vulnerable continue to get access to justice that they really do need. Mm. Um, and I think I just wanted to finally touch on, on collaboration. I think others have touched on it. I think um, the sector came um, came together and a, and a number of roundtables were set up, including the MRs um, work, but also the advice sector. And I think that as a forum has been incredibly valuable to hear what each, each one of us is doing, because I think together, we can achieve more, but if we all work in our own silos, and then Sham, thank you very much for that. Uh, Victoria, same achieve. question to you: that that the key learning and doing things better in the future. Well, I think the collaboration of the employment sector, the advice sector in London, uh, in, has proven to work. Trust for London are looking into rolling out something similar: immigration and, and housing, and obviously that that's not rolling out beyond. London because of the nature of the funder, but I think more a, a sense of providing a space for those expert lawyers to come together in this, in, in this sector has worked really well to offer support and, and a space to share and develop ideas. I think for me, um, how we go forward has to include some vision of how we can recruit, retain, attract employment lawyers into the advice sector. There's a lot of competition for employment experts in the unions and in the private sector. Um, in September alone, we were within the network recruiting six different employment experts. And when I checked on, in on those numbers a month later, only one of those positions had been where they successfully recruited an employment advisor, the others they hadn't recruited. Um, and largely, I think that's because First of all, the money, but secondly, most of those posts were for six months. And I think, you know, you, you are, all, you, how can people think that it's okay to, to go to a job for six months? At the time of such uncertainty, there needs to be much more certainty so that we make sure we capture the interest of new, new people coming through to this profession and keep them involved in this sector and show that there is a real reason to join and a, a real need for those brilliant young minds to join this sector and make a difference in particularly in employment law. Thank you for that. Um, let's hear from Chris and then Chile. I'll just ask Chris and Chile, just both one point each would be appreciated. So Chris first. Yeah, absolutely. My, my one point is we've, we've got to look after our people. The justice system isn't courtrooms and it's not broadband and it's it's not it's, you know, two screens, et cetera, et cetera. It's the people that deliver the services and we need the resources to look after the people that deliver the services properly. We've heard so many examples of how that's not working. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've got to make sure that the people that are delivering the services are supported. You know, there's a dark irony in that the professionals that um, provide arguably the, the, the most important support to individuals, families and communities are the ones that are paid the least and valued the least by society and by government. And that's got to change. Thank you for that. And final point from you, Chile. Uh, ditto Chris's remarks and the point, which is that um, the, we're all here today. Uh, we haven't heard directly from anybody who's a service user, a beneficiary, whatever you want to call it. Claire referred to it. We absolutely have to not just talk about people without means uh, in some vacuum, but sort of get our hands slightly dirty or very dirty, actually. And also recognise that the access points for most people's journeys into advice and hope we see some civil legal redress starts either with people like Law for Life that I mentioned before, which is fantastic in advice now, but also with the, the advice sector. Uh, and this is not just the specialist, the, the sort of food chain, if you like, is much broader. So if we disengage from or don't support or show support for community organisations or small community organisations, problem nurses, etc., there'll be no food in the chain for advocate, for law works, for, for this, you know, litiga strategic litigation cases, we've got to be so careful. It's an entire sector. And people talk very fondly of the advice sector, but actually it's more in practice. And also don't fear business. We're doing great we work with Aviva at the moment about an alternative way of providing legal advice in Bristol. Don't fear business, don't fear academia, make contacts, build on contacts, collaborate, but make it real. 
Yeah, uh, Chili, thank you very much for that all. Um, well, my job as a facilitator is very easy because I don't need to try and round up what you've said because I think so many of these themes will be coming back to during the course of the conference today. Um, nonetheless, my job is to thank all of the panellists on behalf um, of, of conference attendees. You've provided a comprehensive and honest assessment of the impact of the, pa of the pandemic and we're very grateful indeed. I think much of what you said will also be picked up on in the next session looking at the evidence base. Um, my job is obviously to, to wish you as panellists well, uh, both for the rest of the conference, Victoria for the mediation course, and kind of to wish other attendees well as well. Uh, let me hand back briefly to Sir Robin as we move into the break. Thank you. And it's for me on all of our behalf to say thank you to Elizabeth for uh, superbly facilitating that session. I I'm delighted that uh, facilitating each of the plenaries and the breakouts, we have a member of the Civil Justice Council, um, uh, sometimes accompanied by other valued colleagues. Um, but I hope that will give um, everybody a chance to see the members of the Civil Justice Council in action. Uh, many, many thanks to Elizabeth. We take a short break now um, and to reconvene at 11.30. Again, Please don't come out of the system as a whole. Uh, t t turn your, um, keep your camera off and your microphone off and connect to the next plenary session at 11.30. Thank you very much. <laughs>